Good morning, everyone, and welcome this morning to Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church. Welcome to all who are joining us online. Thank you for making us a part of your morning um, as we come together to worship and to be in this sacred space together. Um, we give thanks for the continuing efforts of people in the medical field. Now that some of us have had our boosters, there's like a little bit of added protection and and some of our folks are able to be with us again, so we're so grateful to see folks again. Um, on this uh, 25th Sunday after Pentecost, this is our last regular Sunday of the year. Uh, next week is Christ the King Sunday, and then, yes, already we're going into Advent. Um, time marches on. Uh, sometimes I think time races on, <laughs> but... Um, and, and I want to thank everyone for um, your continued support and stewardship in these last nearly two years, hard to believe. Um, it has really been such an uplifting thing, not only for me, but for your council and, and folks to realize that 
we are, we're keeping up, we're making it through, and even blazing some new trails, which is so exciting. Um, want to just quickly introduce my son, Tim, who's back here. Um, Tim is with me for a couple months on leave before he goes to his next duty station in Georgia. Um, so, uh, so glad to um, have him with me. Um, I think he's... <laughs> um, uh, Tim has most recently been serving in South Korea, so if you um, have questions about that, maybe he could answer them. Um, for those who asked, he did not bring me kimchi, and that does not make me sad. So, just saying. <laughs> um, let's begin, as we always do at the beginning of worship, in a time of quiet. We acknowledge God around us, God beneath us, God within us, the divine surrounding us and holding us together. I invite you to rise as you're able for our confession and forgiveness. We begin the service with this so that we remind ourselves that even though we come into God's presence of broken people, God has already forgiven us even before we ask. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have built walls instead of tables and have turned away the stranger. We have sought glory for ourselves and have treasured that which does not satisfy. Help us to love as you love, to welcome those you send, and to treasure mercy and justice. Turn us from our ways to your ways, and free us to serve those in need. Amen. God, who makes all things new, forgives your sins for Jesus' sake and remembers them no more. Lift up your heads and your hearts. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. And our gathering hymn this morning is built on a rock on page 16 in your bulletins.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we hear from God in scripture, preaching, and song. The first reading this morning is from Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be Our psalm this morning is Psalm 16. And let's just read it together. My heart is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body shall rest in hope. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. Boundaries enclose a pleasant land, Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart therefore is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our second reading is from uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, 
and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to welcome the Holy Gospel by rising and we'll sing together verse two of As Saints of Old on page four in your bulletins. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. and I. today. Good. So in our second lesson, um, the person that wrote it talks about when we ask forgiveness for what for things we've done wrong. And they talk about how what I like what I said at the beginning for confession and forgiveness, that even if we've done something wrong, God has already said, that's okay, I still love you. And try to do better next time. Um, you know how sometimes, like if you get a, if a friend gets mad at you and they might not like talk to you for a while, and that hurts. But God isn't like that. God will still talk to us and love us, even if we've messed up. Um, do you think that, do you think that any of us could live perfectly without ever messing up? Yeah, me either. <laughs> And that's one of the most wonderful things about God's love is that God recognizes that. God says, I get it. You, you mess up, and I still love you, right? Um, and so when we have friends who might have messed up and they might feel bad, it might be a really nice thing to say, that's OK. I still love you. And then there's the end of that lesson, and it's this really interesting word that says you should provoke each other to good things. 
Now, usually if your parents say, you are provoking me, they mean that you're making them mad. But what the lesson is saying is be really intense and, and excited about helping other people do good things. Right? It's a different provoke, which is kind of cool, right? Yeah, that we can help other people do good things. Okay? All right, let's pray. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you for today. Thank you for loving us and forgiving us and helping us to help other people do good things. Amen. All right, thank you so much. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from our loving God through Christ who reminds us to not be afraid. Amen. So if there is one thing that seems to have occupied the time of more than a few evangelical preachers over the last many years, it's the prediction of when the world will come to an end. Using everything from numerology to far-fetched interpretations of scripture to flat-out snake oil salesmanship, people across the centuries have attempted to figure out when will Jesus return and when will the world end? And when will the so-called rapture occur? Well, here we are. <laughs> One of the most recent of these predictions was Harold Camping's assertion that Jesus' return and the world's end would, I quote, absolutely occur on May 21st, 2011. Obviously, the day came and went with nothing of the kind. Camping had actually predicted the same sort of doomsday scenario back in 1994. The May 21st prediction was very widely publicized, of course, because now we were in the age of social media. He even had this blazoned across billboards all over the country. It was so publicized that the folk group Nickel Creek wrote a song about it. And one of the verses goes like this. Well, I've never been so sure, and I've never led no one astray, except in the fall of 94, but hallelujah, the 21st of May. How can we be surprised when people give Christians so little credibility? And we know that elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus reminds the disciples, it's not for us to know the time and place. Because honestly, if that were our task, nothing else would ever get done. Certainly, we wouldn't have time to love and serve our neighbor. And that ties into the deeper dynamic in this story. Jesus continues to draw attention to the imbalances and inequities that stand over against the reign of God. When the disciples are impressed by the scale and the majesty of the temple, Jesus reminds them that, like anything made by man, this too could be leveled in short order by what insurance companies like to call acts of God. The disciples, specifically Peter, Andrew, James, and John, are really preoccupied with the when of this. When is it going to happen, Jesus? What should we look for? Give us a checklist. We know from our perspective all these years later that were they to concentrate only on the when, they would never see the what, the why, and most importantly, the who. They'd be too busy predicting to have any time for serving and proclaiming. These men had also grown up with the understanding that this temple, this temple that was built by Herod the Great, this is one that, this was a house of prayer that would stand forever against all adversaries. Jesus, however, sees the temple as part of a system that oppresses and marginalizes people, particularly the poor. And when he takes the seat opposite the temple, he makes a definitive statement of opposition to the dominant system of the time. 
He's continuing to redirect the narrative away from what is to what could be, and in so many ways, what already is, are already not yet. And then from verse 5 to the end, Jesus' words seem as if they're describing our own times, not to mention several eras in the past. We might know or recall people who claim either to be an emissary of God or even Jesus himself, people claiming to possess the sole truth. We are no strangers to earthquakes and wars and famine, all sorts of other disasters and challenges to the human race. You need only open the newspaper. And so when folks cherry pick this passage along with several others, they have led people astray. It is the last sentence, though, that gives us the deepest sense of hope, I think. This sentence, this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. I think that holds true for us even today. Thinking of my own labor with my son, if you had told me several months earlier towards the beginning of my pregnancy that I would either be in passive or active labor with him for nearly two days, I would have told you you were nuts and that we would certainly do better than that. You know where this is going. From the time when I could feel contractions in the earliest stage to the time when Tim was born was nearly two days. I'll spare you the details, and I will simply say that in the space of those two days, as the contractions progressed, time really ceased to exist for us. We had no idea of when Tim would arrive, simply that he would. My husband and I were focused on the task at hand. I believe there was a football game played that afternoon that we were listening to. I know that the Chargers played because we were in San Diego County. I have no idea who they played, what the score was, because we were concentrating on what was at hand. And I think God calls us to think likewise of these times. Some of us have lived through many wars, more than our share of earthquakes or other natural disasters, plenty of challenges up to the level of famine. Those things have occurred around our world in our lifetime over and over, and that's before we consider the rest of human history. In the larger picture of God's time, we can't possibly imagine where we fall in that great cosmic timeline. It is for us to take God at God's word when we hear, see, I am making all things new. And it's also for us to realize that when God makes things new, the old is transformed. God is constantly calling us to look for where God is at work in the world, to seek out the places where what we might have done before can happen in a new way today. And in all that looking and seeking, what we do have is this place, this place where prayers have been said for decades, this place that has been honored with human words and human agony and human joy, where it is possible to be in a physical space that brings us together into a spirit of prayer and worship. There is that emotional lift, that bonding with the larger human community over many years and now even across virtual spaces. The spirit will work as the spirit will. How might we imagine Shepherd of the Hills sh several years from now if we take God seriously when God says, see, I am making all things new? In the months to come, we will enter a season of prayer as a congregation. In these hopefully waning days of the epidemic, 
instead of filling the calendar with busy work, we will instead mark our days by prayer and holy imagination. Trusting that God is truly making all things new, we'll pray within the rhythms of the church year, season by season. We will pray together and listen together and discern together. Scholars have spoken of this gospel passage as one where Jesus is urging the disciples to think along the lines of this temple-based life they've known, not being either destroyed or restored, but rather moved, transformed, made into something altogether new that doesn't exist on the backs of the poor, but rather levels the field. It's like those words from Isaiah, the valleys lifted and the mountains made low. God is truly doing a new thing here at Shepherd of the Hills. It may not look like anything we've known before, but we know that God is loving and faithful. And so I hope that we are all joined together in this time of prayer. We cannot move into God's new creation without listening for God first. And whether we are near the beginning or the end of these birth pangs, it is amazing to think that God would call us to be a part of making all things new. But Christ's redemptive work for us has made it so. May we live fully and joyfully into that call, wherever it might take us. Amen. Our hymn of the day this morning is a wonderful spiritual, My Lord, What a Morning. It's on page 18 in your bulletins, and I invite you to rise as you're able.
we join our voices together as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page five in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended Eternal God, you hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in need. God, our creator, you show us the path of life. Bless faithful people everywhere with humility as they extend compassion to those who have ex experienced harm in religious spaces. Cultivate healthy congregations that tell of and enact your reconciling love. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, our constant, you love our universe from beginning to end. As the seasons change, protect animals that migrate and hibernate. Bring them safely to a sheltered place and a more abundant season. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, our ruler, you write your law on human minds and hearts. Give wisdom to all elected leaders and officials to govern with insight and compassion. Make them mindful of the well-being of all people so that your world will flourish. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our stronghold, you are present amid both disease and disaster. We pray for those affected by natural disasters. Come to the aid of all who are affected by illness of any kind, especially those whom we name before you, either aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. Calm their fear, supply their need, and be the solid ground beneath their feet. God, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. God, our guide, you are greater than we can imagine. Surround congregations with your expansive inclusion. Be present in the midst of disagreements, differences, and questions. Unite people of diverse viewpoints in the love of Christ. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, our beginning and our end. Your beloved people shine like the brightness of the sky. We thank you for the lives of all who rest in your eternal mercy, from famous saints to the people we have loved. Assure us of your resurrection promise. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our hope and strength, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share that peace in a safe manner with one another. Those of you at home, I invite you to bring bread and wine or other juice to the table that we might share in the meal. We have offering baskets at the back for those of you here. And those of you online, we invite you to contribute to our ministry, either online or by sending a check to the church. Thank you for your stewardship.
yours and everything in it. Yet you have chosen to dwell among your creatures. Come among us now in these gifts of bread and wine and strengthen us to be your body for the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able that we might give. Up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. Surrounded by evil and bordered by death, we appeal to you, our sovereign, our wisdom, and our judge. We praise you for Christ, who proclaimed your reign of peace and promised an end to injustice and harm. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it, and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for them all to drink, saying, this cup is the new promise in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, the sacrifice of his life and death and the victory of his resurrection, we await with all the saints his loving redemption of our suffering world. Send your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and on all who share in the body and blood of your Son. Teach us your mercy and justice and make all things new in Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A feast is, of love is offered here for you and all the saints. Come and be fed. Please be seated. For communion, the table is set with regular pita bread and with gluten-free bread. The trays on the outer ring are wine, and on the inside are white grape juice, so that whatever your need, you will know you are welcome at this table, for it is Christ's table, and it is Christ who invites us.
blessed Jesus, at this table you have been for us both host and meal. Now send us forth to extend our tables and to share your gifts until that day when all feast together at your heavenly banquet. Amen. Amen. Just a few announcements as before we bless and send into this week. Um, I will be uh, doing continuing education this week, um, locally online. Um, so we'll see if I survive eight hours of Zoom per day. That, that's going to be, uh, that will be my cross this week, I guess. Um, I will be in town if there are any needs, uh, just let me know. Uh, coming up, as I said, this next Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, which ends our church year. And then the following Sunday, November 28th, we will begin our Advent season. Um, on that Sunday, we will have um, Advent bags to take home with devotionals and other materials that will begin our journey um, of prayer, of a time of being in prayer and learning to notice God at work in various places. Um, the uh, curriculum that we're using is called the Advent Conspiracy. And the whole idea around this is that we return to the, the simpler modes. Um, and I, I thought about using this when I first um, heard someone say, I can't remember where it was, but they said, oh my gosh, the supply chain problems, how could we possibly have Christmas? And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> So there are four tenets of this Advent conspiracy. Um, worship fully, uh, give more, love others. I can't remember all four of them, but that will be in the, um, in the devotional material to take home, along with some fun activities. Uh, there is a Christmas light scavenger hunt that I think is just a riot. Um, it asks you to look for all different kinds of things with Christmas lights. So. Um, those will be um, available here at church starting on November 28th. Um, uh, those of you who are at home, if you need us to bring those to you, please do let us know and we'll make sure that that happens. Um, happy to bring things around. Uh, the Cookie Fair will be happening as part of the Arts and Crafts Bazaar at the uh, fairgrounds on Saturday, December 4th. Uh, Becky Price and Patty Ducheneau and myself are kind of organizing that. Um, we could really use bakers. Um, I think we have enough people to work at the booth at the, um, at the fairgrounds, um, but bakers were asking um, uh, any kinds of cookies or bar cookies or candies that have non-perishable, uh, not needing to be refrigerated fillings. Um, that's a health department requirement. And then if you could package them in, in little bags of three. Um, we're looking for those Ziploc bags with the Christmas um, uh, decoration on them. Or, uh, we're still looking. That may be a supply chain issue. But um, uh, you know, regular Ziploc bags are fine too. That way folks can, um, can indicate which um, they would like. And then those of us working the booth, gloved and so on, will be able to assemble those in a box for them. Um, it's different from how we've done it in the past, but we're going to give it a try um, and hope to contribute to um, the whole Christmas in the Gorge experience. Um, that, now that we can have a bit of it again and that the parade will happen on Friday, um, we want to be a part of um, bringing some cheer this holiday season to this community. So we're very excited about that. Um, let me see. Are there any other, any other announcements? When I'm up here on a Sunday, I forget at least half of what everyone has ever told me. So, <laughs> All right then, let us bless and send into this new week. If I would invite you to rise as you're able. God, the beginning and the end, who has written your name in the book of life, bless and keep you in grace and peace from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. And our sending hymn this morning, Give to Our God Immortal Praise, on page 20 in your bulletins.
Thank you for everyone who's joined us online. Blessings on your week. Thank <laughs> you.